Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time at First Baptist Church of Central City. We would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. I break out in a coffin fit. I'm pretty sure that a, a piece of that uh, bandana fuzz went right down my throat. So that's what it is. In fact, excuse me. Woo, got me. All right. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Uh, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and as we know, and as I'm sure you remember, the Corinthian church in the first century had a lot of issues. Uh, they were practically a train wreck as far as how they function as a church. And one of the issues that they faced was a lot of disunity due to some believers there who were arrogant believers, we are told, uh, feeling that they were superior to other believers. And this was based on a variety of factors. Uh, we actually saw when we were in the passage about the Lord's Supper uh, how there was a difference between the haves and the have-nots. And so ultimately there was a socioeconomic superiority that some felt toward others in the church. There was also a sense of superiority over knowledge. Uh, some of these arrogant believers knew that there absolutely were no other gods other than the Lord, and so they made the argument that it was absolutely fine to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Of course, the issue there was that uh, weaker brothers in the faith and brothers and sisters in the faith who didn't understand that began to think by their example that it was okay to worship these idols, and so they were falling back into idolatry. Uh, those who were arrogant said, well, that's their problem. If they can't figure that out, that's on them. And so there was a feeling of superiority based on knowledge. And also there was a feeling of superiority based on a so-called freedom. Uh, essentially, they felt that since they had been freed from the power of sin, nothing they did, uh, nobody that they chose to be in any way could be sinful. They were free from sin and so they could live however they wanted. All of this and all of these senses of superiority fly in the face of, first of all, reality. Uh, we know from what the scripture teaches us that all people are made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, every single human being on the face of the planet has dignity and value because we are made in God's image. But we also know that since the time of Adam and Eve, all human beings are born into sin. We all wrestle with our sinful nature and we need to be saved from our sins. And the only means of salvation is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And when a person repents and believes on Christ, that person is saved. But finally, uh, we know that God uh, has made us all equal in Christ. When a person is saved, there is equal standing that we all have. We all receive the perfect record of Jesus, and his record does not deviate from person to person. Uh, no one person is going to come uh, before the Lord one day in judgment and say, well, this person is saved, but this person is really saved. They're really special. Uh, ultimately, we all receive the record of Christ. Uh, this sense of superiority also flies in the face of God's command, though, because we know that uh, Jesus has told us to love one another. And he has said that the watching world will know his people by our love for one another. Finally, this sense of superiority flies in the face of our purpose. God has a purpose for every single believer in Christ. And because it is his purpose for us, that means that your purpose, the purpose he has for you, is no more or no less valuable than someone else's purpose. This ties into kind of what we're getting into today because one additional way that these distinctions had been made in the church in Corinth were through spiritual gifts. 
And these who were arrogant were arguing that some gifts were better than others. And of course, who had the best gifts? Well, of course, they did. They did. And specifically, as we'll see in a later passage, as we continue to go through this letter in coming weeks, uh, they argued that speaking in tongues was a superior gift. And so if you had the gift of speaking in tongues, you were on a whole nother level from everybody else. But if you didn't have that gift, then your gifts weren't quite as good. You weren't on the same level of spirituality. But there's other problems that comes with these spiritual gifts as well. One of which is that some were practicing gifts in a fraudulent way. And this led to some very, very serious, dangerous problems in the church in Corinth. So this morning, very simply, we're asking the question, what are spiritual gifts and how do they shape our unity and our mission as the body of Christ? That's the question we're asking as we look now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit, excuse me, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you again today for this opportunity that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and to hear from your word. And Lord, we ask now humbly that you would speak directly to us the message you would have us to hear from your word. God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and that you would move in our hearts and in our midst today. God, that you would cause us to come to a greater faith and a greater hope, Lord, and a greater uh, discipleship as we seek to follow you and surrender ourselves to you. Lord, help us to become better at repenting of our sins. And Lord, help us never to justify our sins, but rather to be examined by you and to receive your correction. God, we thank you for giving us this time in your word, and we pray now again that you would speak to us. Help us not to be distracted, but help us to hear the word that you have for us today, on October 31st, 2021. Lord, speak to your people, we pray. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Look with me again, if you would, to verse 1. Verse 1, Paul writes, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Uh, He begins there, now concerning, and you may remember, because we've talked about this before, as Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth, he's actually responding to two different groups. Uh, He's responding, first of all, to a letter that he has received from different groups of believers. And what they are wanting is for Paul to be on their side. They're wanting him to justify their arguments and ultimately to provide them with some ammunition so that they can say to the rest in Corinth, you see, we were right. Here it is, and now you need to follow us as well. Uh, But Paul has also heard from those who are faithful in the church, specifically those of Chloe's household, and so he has the whole picture of what's going on there in Corinth. He also knew the context of Corinth and what they were coming out of, and he'd started the church there, so he knew a lot about them. So as we remember that, we know he's quoting their letter at various times, and he's also answering questions that they've asked, and that's what's happening Here, they've asked about spiritual gifts and spiritual matters. So he says, I do not want you to be unaware. 
Right. He is about to go into something that is incredibly, incredibly important for us today. This applies to us today. And uh, it's ironic, this wasn't planned, that we'd be talking about this on Halloween, because ultimately, at Halloween, people like to think about the supernatural, and they like to think about spiritual things. And we live in a time today that has been incredibly starved of spiritual realities. And therefore, people hunger for whatever seems spiritual. N.T. Wright, Christian theologian, refers to our spiritual situation being like a country in which all the springs of water have been paved over. And the water has been sent through a piping system. And over the years, the water has built up pressure until finally it has burst through the pavement. And so now thirsty people can come and they can drink natural water. But coming up through those pipes and coming up through the pavement, that water is muddy and it is dangerous to drink. Wright says that's what our spiritual reality today is like. Ultimately, people who are spiritual beings, God made us to know Him and to be connected to His Holy Spirit. People have become so fed up with the modern scientific denial of all things spiritual, as well as the sterilized, non-spiritual structures of organized religion, that they have begun turning to anything and everything that sounds even remotely spiritual. On Friday, I actually saw a news report online about the resurgence of witchcraft. And it was talking about, they did an interview with a, a shop owner where you can go to stores now and you can buy books that teach you how to cast spells and you can buy uh, ingredients to make potions so you can practice witchcraft. Uh, ultimately, whether or not those things are legitimate or those people know what they're talking about doesn't matter. What matters is people are hungry for these things and they're seeking after something. I would add to Wright's point that there's also a desire today uh, to be unique in our culture. Everybody wants to be one of, kind, one of a kind. So there's a demand for things that are odd and taboo in the world, whether it provides fulfillment or not. We're like the ancient Athenians in that way. We're always wanting to hear something new. But our world looks very much like the ancient world of the Corinthians in this way. Today find an abundance of paganism, an abundance of what we would call anti-God spirituality that's out there. And so there is a confusion in a lot of people's minds between something that's spiritual and something that is specifically Christian, something that's connected to Christ. In our world today, it's easy for someone to think of anything as spiritual being something that is coming from God. But brothers and sisters, we know that is not the case. In fact, Paul went into that just a couple of chapters prior to this one. We need to be aware of spiritual matters. We need to recognize that there are spiritual forces at work in the world. And we need to be aware of who the one true God is. So with all that, really, he begins, verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. What he's saying there is uh, the Corinthian church came out of paganism. They were used to many gods and many temples where you could worship all kinds of different entities. And during that time before they knew Christ, they were led astray to all of these things in various ways. And he calls them mute idols. What he's saying there is they were absolutely powerless. They couldn't answer the people's prayers. They couldn't hear them and respond to them. They couldn't save them. They couldn't help them. They couldn't provide for them in any way, shape, or form. And yet the people were still led after them. Uh, we see the parallel in our lives today before we know Christ, how easy it is to look for fulfillment and satisfaction in every single thing that we can find. Anything that we think will give us purpose for living, we will go after until we find our satisfaction in Christ alone. He says this, verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now again, they were used to paganism. 
And they were used to multiple gods, and they were used to hearing multiple things. And so the temptation for them would be to hear from someone, well, you know, Jesus is accursed, and to go after that teaching. Now, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, but he also says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does he mean when he says that? Is he literally saying that non-believers and atheists can't even utter those three words? That they try to say it and the words just won't come out. Jesus is, mm, right? That they can't say it. That's not what he's saying. Rather, what he's talking about there is unless the Holy Spirit has worked in a person's life and in a person's heart and soul, they cannot give a profession of faith that Jesus is their Lord, that they have surrendered to him, they've given their lives for him. They have died and received the new life that Jesus gives, and he is their king. He is their master. Not only because that is a difficult thing to say, it is an impossible thing to say apart from the Spirit, but also because of the persecution that comes with that. Uh, that kind of phrase, that kind of profession demands loyalty. And the Corinthians would have known this better than just about anyone. Anyone in the Roman world would have known this because when you said Jesus is Lord, that also meant that Caesar was not, which could get you arrested, beaten, killed, and could even see those consequences come to your family and friends. So he makes the point clear here, but he also has given that litmus test that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. Why would he have to lay all of this out for the Corinthians? And the reason is because with real spiritual gifts comes fraudulent applications, fraudulent portrayals of those gifts. And with that comes dangerous consequences. Let's just imagine for a moment that we were in that Corinthian church. And say there was someone who was there and they got caught up in an emotional fervor and they started getting carried away and pretty soon they stood up because they felt passionate and they said, I have a prophecy from the Lord. I have a word to share with you from God. And as they begin to rant and ramble and as I probably have been known to do, uh, you start to speak quickly and you start to get a little bit nervous because, oh, I'm running out of things to say and what should I say next? And so you just kind of talk and words just kind of flow out and pretty soon maybe this person says something like, uh, you know, and Jesus is accursed. He's accursed. After all, he died on the cross. And Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What if someone in a so-called prophetic frenzy took that verse out of context to say that Christ remains accursed that to this day if you associate with him you would be cursed and so we know he accomplished salvation for us but ultimately we have progressed past him we are superior to him now he is accursed perhaps more realistically maybe someone is a little bit boastful and braggadocious that they have the word the gift of prophecy and God speaks through them. And say the Romans come around and they put the sword to that person's neck and they say, curse Jesus. And so that person says, Jesus is accursed because they're looking to save their own skin. And then they try to worm their way out of that with a congregation saying, well, God gave me that word in that moment. Paul gives a litmus test here no one speaking by the Spirit can say Jesus is accursed. And on top of that, he says that only a redeemed believer can proclaim Christ as Lord. Then, in the next few verses, he gives a list of gifts, but not before describing where they come from. Remember, there's a, an issue of division in the church. So he says this, verse 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. In each of those passages, he lists the persons of the Trinity. And his implication is there is no division in God. 
God is not divided in his purpose. God is not divided in what he is doing in the world through his church and for his kingdom. So ultimately, there must be unity in his body as well. There must be unity among believers. And look at what he says there. Verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. You might have a different gift than someone else, but it's the same spirit who has given them, so there must be unity. There is diversity in the body of Christ, but it brings us together for a purpose. It doesn't create wedges to drive us apart. Verse 5, there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. The indwelling Christ calls his people to ministry. If you're a believer, then you have a ministry. You have been called to serve the kingdom of God and to serve others in some way. Now, there are varieties of ministries, right? Uh, Right now, today, your calling is not to pastor this church because that's my calling on October 31st, 2021. Not to say it wouldn't be your calling at a later date, right? You might be called to pastor another church, but you have a ministry that God has given to you and he wants you to fulfill it. It's the same Lord, he says. Verse 6, there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. God works his way out in every single person differently. Differently. But we are called to be unified. Verse 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It talks about manifestation there. That means it's given to be used publicly. You are supposed to use your gift publicly in a way that makes known the work and the glory of God, a way that points people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is for the common good. Your spiritual gifts are not to be used in isolation for your own purposes, for your own intent, for your own benefit. It's to be used for the building up of the church and the glory of God. Then beginning in verse 8, he gives us a list of the spiritual gifts. Now understand, this isn't an exhaustive list. This isn't all the gifts of the Spirit. We find others uh, in the New Testament. Uh, but this is a big list. And ultimately, he's responding to the issues that the church was having there in Corinth. So look at verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. It talks about word of wisdom there. It's talking about a God-given insight into the workings in and through Jesus Christ. Uh, The mystery of God's plan, what God has been doing from the foundations of the world to bring salvation to his people. Some people have been given the, the gift of explaining that, of giving that message to others, just as Paul had this gift. And he mentions word of knowledge. That's a revelation from God. It could be about situations that the church is facing, decisions that they're going to have to be made, uh, perhaps an upcoming event like a persecution that they're going to face. Some people are going to have that word to share with believers. But here's the key thing. These are two separate things that the church in Corinth, these arrogant people have said that they have. They said, we have wisdom. We have knowledge. Paul has already told them, if you think you have knowledge, you don't. If you think you have wisdom, you really don't. Don't. And then he says, even if you actually did, you need to understand these aren't things that you accomplished for yourself. You didn't conjure them up on your own. The Holy Spirit gave them to you. It is a gift, which means you are no one special. Verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Notice there. The same spirit, the one spirit, he's emphasizing the unity. He talks about the gift of faith. This is not a saving faith, but rather it's the kind of faith that moves mountains. Because again, this is talking about Christians, those who have already put faith in Christ for salvation. But God gives the gift of faith uh, that we would have a great and unshakable faith, the kind of faith that moves mountains. He talks there as well about gifts of healing. And notice that's plural, gifts of healing. This is not a power that people would have within themselves. Okay, so anytime you hear about someone who walks around as a healer, and they say, well, the power just kind of comes out, and uh, maybe God told me to slap the person or kick the person or punch the person. Uh, that really gets said by people, right? People say that. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, I mean, the Holy Spirit just leads you to hit someone? Yeah, of course he does. 
Uh, This is ridiculous. But people claim to be healers that the power is just within them. This is talking about gifts of healing. In other words, that people would be selected at various times in various places as God's agents through whom healing would come. In other words, maybe you go to visit someone who's very sick and you pray for them and the prognosis is not good and yet that person is miraculously healed by the power of God. Then in that moment, God gave you the gift through your prayer to see a healing come about in that person. That's what it's talking about here. Verse 10. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Effecting of miracles there, again, in times and places, God uses certain people as agents of his powerful works. Uh, Maybe a farmer is desperate for rain, and there's no rain in the forecast, and there's been a drought. And someone, a brother or sister, comes by and visits, and they pray for rain. And next thing you know, here comes rain. Uh, This is God working in his world as God is able to do, but giving that gift of doing it through someone. He mentions prophecy there. That's preaching a word from God. Uh, This primarily is done today through his word. So what I'm doing right now is prophesying to you, uh, not a message that God gave me on the spur of the moment last night, but rather a message that is in his word today. He mentions distinguishing of spirits. This is the gift of being able to discern between false prophets and true prophets. False prophecies and true prophecies. Now we can do that, all of us, through God's word. You can compare what someone says with what the Bible says and know whether or not they're speaking truth. But some people have the gift of being able to do that through discernment rather quickly. You all are familiar uh, with charlatans, televangelists, snake oil salesmen on television who will say, send your money, right? Send your money to me. This is very different, by the way, than uh, being told uh, what God's word says, which is that all believers are called to tithe and give their offerings through the local church. Uh, That's God's command. And God says that he's going to bless us when we do that, but he never promises that you're going to be Rich. It's not some kind of financial, spiritual, hybrid investment. Uh, But you'll see charlatans on TV who will say, if you send me $1,000, then God, send that to me in my ministry, God's going to bless that. He's going to double that. He's going to bless it sevenfold. They love the number seven. Or he's going to bless it 12-fold, because they love the number 12 too. Or 10 times what you sent. They also love 10 times. Uh, but, But whatever it is that you send, it's a seed of faith And that seed is going to grow, and ultimately you're going to become rich because you had the faith enough to give, and God's going to bless that. I know I mentioned this Wednesday night. I'm going to mention it again, but uh, I'm on a mailing list, thanks to none other than John John Penley. I think Don Dossett might be on this mailing list as well. (laughs) It's a prank that's been played on both of us. But a number of years ago, uh, John John asked me, he said, hey, what's your address? And I thought, oh, he's probably going to send some card, you know, something nice. So I gave him my address. I'll never let that happen again. Uh, And now I get mail, and I get phone calls as well from a false prophet. Uh, His name is Peter Popoff, and he has sent me uh, food coloring dyed water, green water, that says if you will anoint the doorpost of your house and your pillow and pray this prayer and send me some money, uh, then God's going to bless your finances. You have nothing to worry about. And so I get phone calls from this guy. And I'll have a five-minute voicemail on my phone because it's a number I didn't know, and I let it go to voicemail. uh, And I'll check it. And, Don, you know what he says? He says, this is your prophet, Peter Popoff. Don't hang up. That's how he opens because he knows most people are going to hang up. But he's a false prophet. And so we need people who are able to discern truth, true prophecies, true words from God. So this is a gift of the Spirit as well. It mentions tongues, various kinds of tongues. This might as well say various kinds of languages. Uh, We know in the early church uh, that as the church was sent out to all kinds of places where they didn't know the languages, God would miraculously use them to speak a language they'd never studied, they'd never heard, and yet they would be fluent in it. Uh, We should not doubt that God is still able to do this today. 
And likewise to another interpretation of tongues. That's being able to translate what's being said. Look at verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Again, there is unity in the body of Christ. Can you imagine thinking that you have a spiritual gift and it's different than someone else's spiritual gift and that somehow their gift was inferior to yours? What are you saying about the work of God in that moment? What are you saying about his good intention and will and purpose in that person? You're blaspheming what God has done. That's what they were doing. One of the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. It's to the individuals. It's for the whole church. So how do we respond to this passage? What do we do with this? One option that we have is I can tell you how many people have responded by simply arguing that all these gifts have ceased. They were for the early church only. They're no longer for us. The problem with that argument is that there's no biblical grounds to suggest that these gifts were ever intended to cease or that they have ceased. One commentator said about this passage and about the cessationist arguments, that's what that's called. He said, it's a tragedy that the church should have lost touch with the Spirit of God in its ongoing life, that it would settle for what is only ordinary and thus feel the urgency to justify itself in this way. To put it another way, it is an absolute shame. It is a shame that we have so lost touch with the Spirit of God who has been provided to His people, that we would feel it necessary to make arguments to say, this stuff doesn't apply to us anymore. That's simply a lack of prayer. It's a lack of hunger for the Lord. So how do we respond? First of all, the point of the passage he's making, we need to respond with a commitment to unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Satan always desires to bring division and separation among the people of God. We have to strive for unity. We have to strive to be one together, and we must do that. We have to fight for unity. We have to make sure that we're showing grace to one another, because brothers and sisters, all of us still have sin, which means we are going to bump up against one another. We're going to rub each other the wrong way at times, and we're going to have to show one another grace. It's easy to say, yes, we're called to love each other, but it's also very easy to justify those moments in our lives when we just choose not to. We have to love one another and be united as the body of Christ. So we have to commit to that. Second way that we can respond is by seeking, seeking the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not mere empty spirituality, but the Holy Spirit of the one true God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. We need to seek his presence. We need to seek his leading in our lives. We need to seek the gifts that he desires for us to use. There is no substitute for having a real relationship with the living God. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is not some imaginary friend that we pretend to know and we talk about because we know the Bible talks about Him, but ultimately, we have no interaction. We don't know what it's like to feel His presence. We don't know what it's like to be led by Him. I don't know if you've noticed, but every time we gather for worship, Brother Kevin, or Hannah Baby, and myself, we pray that God would move in our midst. That he would send his spirit as he's promised to do. That he would make his presence known to us. 
There is no preacher in the world that can manufacture that for you. There's no song or style of music that can possibly draw you nearer to God. We need the Lord. We need His presence in our lives, in our worship. He's the only one who can fulfill us and move us to serve Him. That's why that hymn says, Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the Word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray. And holy manna will be showered all around. You want to be moved in the service and in your life? It's got nothing to do with emotionalism. It's got to do with encountering the living God. The final way we need to respond is you need to put your gifts to use. If you're a Christian, you have spiritual gifts. If you don't know what those are, search the scriptures. Ask God to reveal the gifts that he's given to you and put those to work within his church. Because those gifts are given to you not to use individually, but for the common good. And also within the church, those gifts are affirmed. People can affirm, yes, you have that gift, or you can be corrected. And we have to walk in humility to recognize that we are not immune to error. Sometimes we need to be corrected. Sometimes we might think, I think I have the gift of prophecy, and then everything we say contradicts the Bible. We need our brothers and sisters to correct us and help us to walk after him. So this morning, let's not be immune to or calloused to the fact that the Holy Spirit desires to work in our lives. And we are called not to quench the Spirit, but to respond to Him. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we know that as those who have received the free salvation that you give, we have eternal life. And Lord, we have a purpose and gifts that you've given us for that purpose to serve you, to minister to others for your glory and for the building up of your kingdom. So God, we ask that you would help us this morning to walk humbly, to seek after you, Lord, and to be moved by your Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way in our hearts and in our lives. We pray, God, that you would help us to remain unified as we seek to use our gifts together as the body of Christ. Lord, help us to be committed to loving one another. And God, help us to be committed to seeking your spirit in our lives, Lord, that you would move us and direct us and lead us in our lives. God, that you would change us and make us more like Christ. And God, help us not to turn to mute idols, things that we love and care for that ultimately cannot fulfill us cannot give us satisfaction. Lord, help us to take no substitute for your Holy Spirit who declares in our hearts that Jesus is our Lord. Father, be with us now, and if there's anything we need to surrender to you or anything we need to commit to or simply anything we need to pray about, God, would you call us to respond? Help us to see our lives changed for your glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.